I'd like to begin by introducing the person that we, that we thanked earlier, but you're going to, actually going to get to hear from her a little bit today. Uh, Chris McClung has done the lion's share of the work putting this uh, conference together, and I think we need to give her a big round of applause. <laughs> well, thanks. I'm really up here to, to say that on everybody's table, there's this little packet of cards. And I'm sorry we didn't have a packet for everybody, but I just want to explain what it is. At Cal State San Marcos, Dr. Merrill Goldberg is a great um, arts advocacy person who has done some incredible things with the Stewart Foundation to uh, allow teachers and other arts advocates to have tools to, to work with their school boards or their principals or whatever. You know, we get a lot of, I don't know, well, here's one. Um, art builds creative, innovative students who can think outside the box. Well, we all know that. And when we tell somebody that, they say, yeah, I've heard that before, and then they walk away from you. But if you go on the website, and it's on each card, and you look up this little phrase that everybody says, you are going to find a depth of research that supports this little itty-bitty statement. It is very, very powerful. So even though you don't have the whole cards, you can find all of these on the website. It's a CSUM website. And um, you got, just follow the directions on here. And it's powerful stuff. So use it. Okay, this morning we talked about our demonstration sites, and I mentioned that one of the, the newest demonstration sites that we have uh, is in Pomona. We needed a site that sort of served that uh, San Bernardino, Riverside, Pomona area, and I was introduced to the School of Art and Enterprise by the gentleman you're going to hear from next who came to me at this conference and says, you need to come see what we have going on. And uh, we did go out there, and it's a very unique school. It's not a school in a large school building like you're used to seeing. Their school is kind of spread out all over the downtown area, the art district of Pomona. And they have very strong performing arts programs, music programs, but also digital media and arts programs. So to introduce this uh, this lunchtime's entertainment, I'd like to introduce Bill Miller. Thank you very much. Uh, five years ago, I sent an email to our director, and I said, do you guys hire people with AME credentials? Because I came from a traditional school model. I worked for an ROP for nine years. And uh, she said, no, but we can. And so I was the first AME teacher hired. And today, for a 6th or 12th grade, 750 student school, we employ 10 full-time arts, media, and entertainment teachers and two part-time AME teachers. So I brought down a little, yeah, it deserves a round of applause. Um, I brought down a little video to show you a little bit more about the School of Arts and Enterprise. So the School of Arts and Enterprise is a really unique school for students and I absolutely love it. I think it gives the opportunity for students to be expressive and learn more about themselves and their major and their art form, but also how to market themselves in the community as an artist. And I don't know of any other school that does that. I'm surrounded by a bunch of other artists and everybody's very passionate about what they do. It's a real community effect and it makes everyone work harder than they usually would because they're surrounded by other people that care. The most important thing I've learned at the School of Arts and Enterprise is to never give up on excellence. I'm allowed to be who I want to be without having to worry about people putting me down and saying that, oh, you're different because we're all different and I really appreciate that. We're inclusive here. We're inclusive. And when we talk about our environment, it's something that we truly want to focus on so that our students understand this is an inclusive place. This is a place where you can be yourself. But also learning the differences among other people and being able to understand how. I see that this person is different, but that's okay. Our environment is something that, as educators, 
we know how important it is and we focus on that culture a lot here at the school. When I walk on campus, I see students playing guitar. I hear students singing in different corners of the campus. When I walk around during lunch sometimes, I'll see students sketching or painting artwork uh, for an exhibit that's coming up. It's just a different environment here, and I'm, I'm fueled by it, I'm inspired by it, I'm encouraged by it. Project-based learning is a very powerful piece of our curriculum. We are able to take the arts integration piece and then putting it into the academic piece so the students see how can I use my artistic ability and my artistic skill in the academic world and then of course in the proverbial real world. One of the main skills we focus on here at the SAE is collaboration. We really focus on working together and creating the best possible versions of ourselves that we can. I love that they're creative. I love that they teach me. When we're in the classroom and we are into discussion or doing some project-based learning, I see the uniqueness that comes from being an artist. They bring a perspective that I don't personally have and it helps us both learn and grow. They look at things with such a different perspective and it brings richness to my teaching and it brings richness to their learning process. I love economics, I love government, I love teaching and I love being here. I know that I definitely wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the School of Arts and Enterprise. I was able to really develop myself as a person. I know I wouldn't get that anywhere else. Because of the School of Arts and Enterprise, I was able to be comfortable with myself to audition for UCLA and get accepted. So to know that the School of Arts and Enterprise can really set you on the path for success, definitely worth it. I would say to someone who's considering coming to the school is to be themselves unrelentlessly because when you are truly yourself, the best people and the best results will happen all of the time. The School of Arts and Enterprise is home. <laughs> so one of the things I think uh, being able to have so many AME teachers is to make sure that our curriculum is always relevant. It's always what's happening in the industry. We find that our students who go on to college or also into the industry feel really prepared with what they're gonna do. We brought down five performers from our musical theater program, and our musical theater program looks a little bit different than most schools. We're constantly bringing out what's new in the industry. We're really focusing on the modern American musical, and uh, we're really privileged to bring down five kids to perform four songs for you this afternoon. The first song is from a little known song cycle called It's Only Life by John Bucchino.
I'm Sophia Levy, and I'm going to be singing I Don Quixote from Man of La Mancha. Hear me now, the bleak and unbearable world, who are beached and debauched as can be, and a knight with his banner all bravely unfurled, now hurls down his bullet to the Me heathens and wizards and serpents of sin are your dastardly doings are past for a holy endeavor is now to begin and virtue shall triumph at So ever they blow onward to glory I go Thank you Hello everybody my name is Isaac Jimenez, and I will be singing a song from an upcoming production we're producing at the School of Arts and Enterprise entitled The Last Five Years. This song is called Shiksa Goddess. I'm breaking my mother's heart. The longer I stand looking at you, the more I hear it whisper and crack from 90 miles away. I'm breaking my mother's heart. The JCC of Spring Valley is shaking and crumbling to the ground. And my grandfather's rolling, rolling in his grave. If you had a tattoo, that wouldn't matter if you had a shaved head that'd be cool if you came from Spain or Japan or the back of a van just as long as you're not from Hebrew school I'd say now I'm getting somewhere I'm finally breaking through I'd say hey hey she's a goddess I've been waiting for someone like you I've been waiting through Danica Schwartz and Erica Weiss and the Handelman twins. I've been waiting through Heather Greenblatt, Annie Minkus, Karen Pincus, and Lisa Katz, and Stacey Rosen, Ellen Kaplan, Julie Silber, and Janie Stein. I've had Shabbos dinners on Friday nights with every Shapiro in Washington Heights. But the minute I first met you, I could barely catch my breath. I've been standing for days with the phone in my hand like an idiot scared to death. I've been wandering through the desert. I've been beaten. I've been hid. My people have suffered for thousands of years, and I don't give a shit. If you had a pierced tongue, that wouldn't matter. If you once were in jail or you once were a man, 
If your mother and your brother had relations with each other and your father was connected to the Gotti clan, I'd say, well, you know, nobody's perfect. It's tragic, but it's true. I'd say, hey, hey, Shik's a goddess. I've been waiting for someone like you. Breaking the circle, you. Changing the light, you. You are the story I should write. to drink blood i think it's cute if you had a powerful connection to your firearm collection i say draw a bead and shoot i'm your hebrew slave at your service just tell me what to do i'd say hey 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 i've been waiting for someone i've been praying for someone i think that i could be in love with someone for our accompanist, Julio Broni, really quickly. Um, I'm Taylor Gomer, and I'll be singing um, Avalanche from a song cycle called Tales for the Bad Years. Taking the view from above Mountainous, infinite, mile after mile of the danger you love It's colder than winter, the vertigo starting to lift Don't try to touch, don't warn me too much You're causing a tectonic because I'm falling, I'm falling I'm out of control and it feels like falling nowhere The sign ahead says beware Here comes an avalanche Gaining speed and ice and snow Beware the avalanche, I don't know How to let go Whoa. Whoa. Don't act like it's simple Don't say it's nothing at all Balancing, teetering, pitch to the brink Till you start to snowball Just skimming the surface But I dig a little too deep I weigh all the facts I try to pull myself out But it's steep and I'm falling I'm falling I'm out of control And it feels like falling nowhere The sign ahead says Beware Here comes the avalanche Run for cover and hide Or you'll never survive me I am You'll never get out alive I don't know how you'll survive Cause I'm the destroyer I am the huntress I am the lonely one, the only one I am the heartbroken I am the unspoken I have nothing inside left to give I just have an avalanche Only this avalanche And love Because I'm in love I'm in love With you In love, love. 
It's all an avalanche, we are an avalanche. And we're falling, we're falling, we're falling, falling. Watch out below. Another big round of applause from the students. A fabulous job, absolutely fabulous. Now is a special moment for me. I want to introduce to you a person that I met a while, of, a while ago and um, through one of our demonstration site leaders, Hamish Tyler, who's been a friend for quite a while. And uh, I have been familiar as a theater teacher with the work of Luis Valdez for a long time. And to have the opportunity to meet the person who created such amazing work and has had such an incredible impact on not only theater, but social justice in California and the United States was a tremendous honor. So I would like to introduce Hamish Tyler, who will in, in, introduce our lunch keynote, Senor Valdez. Thank you, Jack. It is my great pleasure and real privilege to introduce a, a mentor, a guide into unexplored realities, and a friend and supporter of arts education for all. But kindly indulge me, please, a, digress a digression back about 25 years ago when I first learned of Luis and his work. A group of very tired and somewhat cynical high school drama teachers were invited to participate in Yale University's summer program, uh, pr promising to rejuvenate us teachers, and, and we certainly needed it. This hardy group of 15 teachers from around the country met on a hot, steamy July day in Yale's famed theater. A very officious assistant stage manager called us all together and gave us a two-paragraph cold reading of Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida and told us to prepare for a reading to determine our place in the program. We had 20 minutes to prepare. Needless to say, we were all petrified. A half an hour later, a stage door opened, and straight from Broadway successes as a director of the latest August Wilson play came the famed director and department head, Dr. Lloyd Richards. I was literally shaking through this experience, and he looked out at all of us, and he said, hey, this is what you routinely do for your auditions for, for your students, the cold reading. And he said, how does that make you feel? He had our attention. And he had us all sit in a circle, and we all had to tell him where we came from, uh, what our accomplishments were, but my last name being Tyler with the T, I had to sweat it out until 
my turn, which was next to the last. I told him about how our private school put on four plays, a musical, toured Europe, went to community theater, and so forth. He looked at me for the longest time and finally asked, where again was I from? I told him, Monterey, Carmel, Pebble Beach. And then he asked, he said, is that close to my good friend Luis Valdez up at El Teatro Campesino? And I said, yes, it is relatively close. And he said, how are you doing? And he was just like beaming, right? Smiling when he said this. However, when I said, I don't know, um, his demeanor changed. And he looked at me and he said, young man, and I was one once, <laughs> if, if you want to really understand the theater in your area, you better know what Luis is doing. And at that moment, I swore to myself that I would know everything he did. <laughs> and I read all of his plays and essays and writings. I went to El Teatro. I worked on my Spanish. And I really went through a transformation. When I finally got to meet Luis, he was directing and administrating at Cal State Monterey Bay, where he had developed an incredibly far-sighted program called Tele Teledramatic Arts and Technology. Now, this was 30-some-odd years ago. He was way ahead of his time, anticipating HBO, Showtime, Amazon, etc. I also had the opportunity to have this amazing experience of working his first high school production that he released to us to do Zoot Suit. We had three completely different separate companies throughout the county produce this show. One was in Salinas, where we actually had a female lead. And Luis was A-OK -okay with that, because she was the best in the auditions. We also had one in South County, where virtually the entire cast was on stage for the first time, and they were almost 100% Hispanic. And we also had one on the Monterey Peninsula, with an entirely different, mostly Caucasian group cast. All of us working together to prepare and produce Luis's gripping and timeless story. And you know, I will never ever forget the transformational moment for me when he brought us all together right before we went out and, and produced Zoot Suit. All three companies, close to 200 kids in the Salinas High School Auditorium. We connected as fellow artists. We had linked hands together. Black students, brown students, white, we were all united to tell the story of justice denied. The local newspaper called this an antidote to gang violence and a gateway to human understanding. You know, I feel very strongly that ultimately, this is what our work should do, unite us in our common humanity. Well, Dr. Richards, I learned my lesson well, and thank you for opening my eyes and my heart to this afternoon's keynote speaker, my dear friend and mentor, Luis Valdez.
Let's see. Good afternoon. Just about with lunchtime. Thank you, Hamish. Thank you. It is uh, my pleasure uh, to be able to address you, fellow teachers and students, people in the arts and technology. It's an incredible feel, so pervasive these days. I'll come back to that. I want to share with you some ideas that may relate to the work that you are doing, that we all continue to do in this world. I consider the arts to be essential uh, to the, human, uh, the progress of the human race. Arts, for me, are a human necessity. And the most fundamental question is, what is art? What is art? The answer is quite simple. Thou art. It is an expression of all our beings. And who are we? There's nothing more incredible, more complex than the human being. The Mayans had a word for this, vibrant being. They called it uniquely. I go back as an American, as a Native American, whose ancestors go back to the beginnings of human civilization in this hemisphere. I, uh, I like to use concepts that come uh, from those roots. Uniquely, or vibrant being, is just one of them. Another one is inlak etch, which is to say, you are my other me, you are my other self. If I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. It's a little more depth, deep than, although it's the same idea, love thy brother as thyself. What it says is, you are your brother. That when you look around and you see other people, you see other human beings, they are reflections of you, moment to moment. So it is amazing that we live in a world that continues to practice human slaughter and the slaughter of children. Not just in our schools and in our movie theaters by allowing weapons of mass destruction to be available to madmen, most of which are unfortunately of Caucasian descent, going mad, but also in other parts of the world, in Syria, the bombing of innocent children. This is an absolute failure to understand who and what the human being is. And my feeling is that it's only through the arts that we can begin to do some essential work here. So I want to discuss a couple of ideas, present them to you. The idea the Mayan idea of zero, because I talk a lot about the power of zero, and I want to explain what I mean by that. Uh, if you want a, a graphic, I would draw a circle, and within the circle there is a box, perfectly positioned. If you want to think about the box, outside the box, you have to go from the box to the outer circular rim. That, in a sense, is the power of zero. The box actually is quite logical and quite masculine. And the circle is all embracing, quite feminine. We need to be women in our time. The power of women, the growing power of women as leaders of state, of nations, and as artists <laughs> is part of the solution. But the power of zero is even more than that because the circle is not just a two-dimensional circle. It is, in fact, three-dimensional if not four-dimensional, it's three-dimensional, so it's a sphere. So what we, we call the aesthetic of El Teatro Campesino the power of zero, but it is also in theater the sphere. And that sphere is articulated not just in the world, but in our bodies, in everything that we do, and I'll come back to it. Above all, it is articulated in the power of emptiness, because the Mayans described zero as an empty fullness and a full emptiness. It's a deep philosophical, very simple, but very complex concept. It's almost mystic. It, in fact, it is mystic, and it combines with all of the most basic thoughts of every religion on earth. Go back to your basics. So in that sense, let me share a couple of little Louis stories with you that go back to the basics. I was born in 1940 in a labor camp in Delano, California, uh, right there in the San Joaquin Valley. I didn't know what I was. <laughs> no one does. You're born into this earth. You look around. You see your mama's breast. There it is. That's the main thing, you know. <laughs> so I was breastfed, you know. 
uh, and, and thank God for that, you know, because I got a lot of juice from my mom. Uh, it, it's a long story. I can't get into all the little Louis stories. Time is short. But let me tell you one of how I got hooked in the theater. Uh, we spent World War II actually quite prosperously uh, living on a farm that I thought was my dad's ranch in, in the Delano area. And I thought we were, uh, actually we had a 1941 Chevy, a brand new Chevy sedan. This is uh, a car of the year. We were a Mexican farm working family. How did we get a 41 Chevy? I didn't wonder about it as a little kid. <laughs> I loved that car. And there was a sticker in the back window that said, Roosevelt in 44. And I remember that quite vividly. And I remember my childhood on this ranch. I was quite happy. I felt complete. Uh, but then came uh, 1945, and World War II ended. And I discovered along the way that the ranch had not been my dad's at all. That he was, in fact, uh, just a, he was borrowed uh, time and borrowed property because the ranch had actually belonged to an Issei, a Japanese-American farmer. And he and his family had been yanked out of that farm and put in a concentration camp. So that was my first begat, beginning sense of guilt, because it not, had not been our ranch, and, and we quickly were dispossessed of that ranch because uh, the GIs came back, American agriculture got reestablished in California, and we were out in the cold. So we hit the migrant path. My parents had been migrant farm workers in the 30s, and uh, I had not experienced that until I was six years old. And suddenly, there we are, on the road. The 41 Chevy disappeared. I think my dad sold it, the only way. And we had an old beat up pickup truck. And so we went to the Garden of Eden, now called Silicon Valley, to pick prunes and apricots and strawberries and uh, whatever there was, tomatoes. And then uh, in the fall, we came back to the San Joaquin Valley to pick cotton. I was a cotton picker. I was a cotton picker with cotton pickers from the South, African Americans, who were experiencing the diaspora coming out of the South, leaving the racism of uh, post-Civil War Jim uh, Crow territory, the Old South, and coming to California in, in, in a hope to be free. But they were still farm workers, so they picked cotton. You don't see African Americans in the fields anymore. Uh, we had the proverbial Okies that were still in the fields, white people. We had Asians, Japanese, Chinese, Sikhs from India wearing their turbans. The whole world was out in the fields. So I think we're all cotton pickers. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know that uh, the world was changing quite that rapidly. And so the cotton season ended very quickly. There were too many people. All the tents, there were army surplus tents that housed 2,000 farm workers started to come down. We couldn't move on because my dad's truck had broken down, this old battered world pickup truck from the 30s. And so uh, we were surviving hand to mouth. Farm workers lived from day to day, and that was us. And so we were fishing in the nearby river, the San Joaquin Delta. And uh, I used to fish with my brother and my dad, and we'd take the fish back to my mom. She would make tacos. We were eating fish tacos before they were trendy. And so one morning, I almost drowned, and my dad saved me. He reached down, grabbed me by the hair, and pulled me out. My mother got very scared. She says, maybe you and your brother better go to school. And so me and my older brother climbed on the big yellow bus, used to come into the camp, and we went to a nearby school in a place called Stratford. You may know it, Stratford. And not Stratford on Avon, Stratford on the San Joaquin. <laughs> and I knew I wasn't going to be there for very long, so I really concentrated on my lunch bag. I was bilingual already. My family crossed that border over 100 years ago. It was my great-grandparents and my grandparents that came. My parents were born in Arizona. So we spoke English and Spanish at home. We were bilingual already. So language was not my problem. My problem was poverty. And so uh, in school, I enjoyed school, but I concentrated on my lunch. But the thing is that that became a critical, uh, disappointing experience for me because I noticed right away that the other kids especially the Anglo kids, had lunch pails. These metal boxes, you know, emblazoned with images, Mickey Mouse and Hopalong Cassidy on the side. And I looked at my mama's taco bag, you know. I had, uh, she had commandeered a little child-sized grocery bag for me, and that was she put her tacos. She borrowed eggs and made egg tacos for us, beans. And that's what I took to lunch. And in the morning, that bag would be under my coat, and it would warm me, and I felt great. You know, I felt mama's tacos. Nothing like mama's tacos. But then lunchtime came around, and I saw those lunch pails, and I suddenly was swept with shame. 
my God, I was ashamed of my mama's tacos. So I'd get away from the crowd and eat my lunch in private. But the kids always saw me, you know. So I had to eat my tacos the way a wino drinks his wine, one bite at a time, right? I'd sneak it out of the bag. and The other kids would say, what are you eating? No, nothing, no, no, no. But then I kept looking at their lunches. You know, they pulled out these two white boards, you know, wrapped in wax paper. No, wait a minute, it's white bread. Okay. And in the white bread were meats, bologna, ham, tomato, lettuce, the whole, the, you know, the works. And I was really impressed. I said, wow, look at that thing. And then usually they had a little cupcake or, or an orange or an apple. And then here's the kicker, a thermos. They would pull out the thermos, open it up, and pour out a Coke, you know, Coca-Cola or milk. Oh, man, this was amazing, these, these lunch pails. And I'd look at my little bag, and my little bag got even worse. You know, it, it, it filled me with shame. But, you know, I kept looking at their lunches. They kept looking at my bag. I kept looking at their lunches. They kept looking at my bag. So one day, the inevitable happened. We exchanged lunches. And the rest is Taco Bell history. <laughs> The thing is, I would save my bag and take it back to my mom, you know? I, I, I would be real careful not to get any grease spots on it. I'd fold it, put it in the closet. One day after school, I go to get it, it's gone. I panicked, I'm looking. The teacher saw me running around. She said, what do you want? And I said, I, I told her, oh, a little brown bag. Yes, I took it. I said, well, give it back. And she says, I can't. And she escorted me into a little back room, and I saw my bag all ripped up, floating in a basin of water. And I said, what did... The teacher went crazy. She went berserk. Said, well, you're loca la maestra, you know? And, but she says, no, wait a minute. And she picked up a little piece of the brown paper bag, dipped it into a white paste, and put it on a mold. For the first time, I noticed a clay mold. It was a face. It was an animal. It was a monkey. And then she put another piece of paper on it, smoothed it out, another piece of paper, smoothed it out. She says, do you want to try it? I said, yeah. And so I tried it, smoothed it out, smoothed it out. And at that moment, I discovered one of the secrets of the universe. It's called paper mache. <laughs> and I said, well, wait a minute, this is November. It was the month of November. I said, it can't be for Halloween. What's this for? And she says, it's for a play, our Christmas play. The whole school's involved, even the eighth graders in the school band. And we need two first graders to play monkeys. It was called Christmas in the Jungle. And so I forgave her about the bag. <laughs> and the next... Monday, I auditioned, and I got my first role in the theater. I got one of the monkey roles, because I could do a monkey, man. I could walk around you know, do, and jump, you know, and she says, okay, you got it. And so I got a costume that was better than my own clothes. I mean, it had a vest, had a little green pants, a little red vest, a little red shoes, you know, a tail, you know, a little hat, and then the mask, the mask that she made from Mama's taco bag. I could almost smell the tacos, you know. And she put it, I put it on, and I looked in the mirror, and I was transformed, man. You know? I was Hanuman, the monkey god. I was a symbol of intelligence in the Mayan culture. I didn't know what I was, but I liked it. And this was going to be my debut before the world. I saw that old school auditorium being transformed. I heard the band playing. And, man, I was, I was about to be launched into the world. So the week of the presentation, I go home, it was like a Tuesday, and I got home, and my mom says, we're leaving tomorrow. And I said, but mom, the, the play's on Friday. And she says, I know, mijo, but we're being evicted. And so I cried, and she cried with me, but the next morning, by force, my dad got the truck started, put all our longing, belongings into the truck, including the kids, and so I was in the back of the truck as we pulled out of the camp and through Stratford and the little town and the school disappeared into the San Joaquin Valley fog and I was crushed. Like a lot of six years old, I could have been ruined for the rest of my life. But I've always believed that any negative can be turned into a positive. That's the rule of the universe. Any negative can become a positive. So in this case, this hole that opened up in my chest opened up and I thought I would never be well. I would never be well. But it, uh, what happened is that I took a number of things with me. One, the secret of paper mache. I could take any paper, newspapers, and turn them into masks, eventually puppets. I took with me the unrequited love of the theater, which is still there. I longed to be on that place so much that that, that missing chunk of my life has stayed with me. 
the love of the theater, wanting to be on the stage. I've never been able to satisfy it. And the third piece was anger, residual righteous anger, because we were evicted from the labor camp. Now, for the last 70 years, I have been pouring plays and poems, screenplays, books into that hole. It's a lot smaller now, but it's still there. I always go back to it. I always go back to the six-year-old. It's really important to maintain the kid in you. And for me, that kid's never going to disappear because that is what motivates me. That's my muse, if you will. You never know who you're teaching, you know? You never know who you're teaching. A few years ago, I, uh, I spoke to a conference of superintendents in Monterey. I told this story. And the present super, at that time, the present superintendent of the Stratford School District liked the story. He said, I'm going to go back and check my records, I guess to verify if I was telling a true story. <laughs> so he did, and I got in the mail a brick from the old school because the Stratford School was being torn down because of the Kalinga quake. And I got that in the mail, and wrapped around the brick was a photostatic copy of the attendance record for the first grade, 1946. And down at the bottom was the name of Louis Valdez. The kid was in school for 30 days. I never knew that. For me, it seemed like I was there for years. <laughs> but it was 30 days. And up at the top was the name of my teacher, Ruth Tremaine. I never knew her name, but there it was. Ruth Tremaine. If she's still alive, God bless her. She must be about 120 years old by now, you know. <laughs> I don't know if she knew. I suspect if she was, if she was a great teacher. She launched me on my life, in my career. She took the time to cast me and dress me. And, and I don't know if she ever knew. But the fact is that, and I say this to all teachers, you never know who you're teaching. You never know. Because I took the magic of paper mache and began to make puppets. I used to make puppets out of potatoes. You know, I was a potato picker, too. In July, of all times, outside of Bakersfield, in 110 degree heat. And as kids, I mean, what can you do? I found a dead man one time uh, leaning against his potato sack when I went to get water. One of the first dead people I ever saw up close, I touched him, you know. I called my dad, they came to get him. He was a dead farm worker. But I used to amuse myself by taking potatoes that looked kind of interesting, that had a human face, you know, with noses. And I'd stick my finger, oh, I got a puppet. This is before Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> and then I'd do the same with carrots, and, and I'd do things with uh, sugar beets, you know. It was, you can do anything with plants. And so I began to do puppet shows, you know. And then uh, eventually I turned into a ventriloquist. I got an old Jerry Mahoney dummy. And uh, he was an Anglo, so he became my friend. I called him Ali Nelson. This was my alter ego, my alter Anglo ego, e ego. And so uh, I had to make him cool, though. I put a little mustache on, a little goatee, you know. He had a little hat, and on the hat, I, point, I painted cool cat. He had to be cool, because <laughs> he was my buddy. And then eventually, I discovered I needed a Mexican puppet, so I made a puppet, Marcelino Pipin, out of balsa wood. And then, uh, by the time I got to high school, I could have dueling conversations. You know, I, come on, guys, don't fight, you know. And, and so they'd snip at each other, bilingually, by the way, you know. Una frase en español, the other sentence in English, you know. Back and forth. So uh, someone saw me perform, a lady came, and, and invited me to this very special thing that was happening in San Jose. By this time, it was uh, 1956, and uh, the KNTV uh, station in San Jose, now the NBC affiliate in the Bay Area, was just starting off. And uh, they needed something to satisfy FCC regulations, so they had one half hour in Spanish on Sunday afternoons. And so they, someone had seen me perform, so they gave me five minutes on the inaugural broadcast, live television. I was 16 years old. I was living in San Jose, East San Jose, in a place called Sal Si Puedes. That's the name for La Barrio. It's, it's kind of common in California. It means get out if you can. <laughs> and, and, and literally, bordering uh, the 101, which is called the Bayshore in those days, our street had, was unpaved. It was a dirt street. A muddy bog during the winter, no street lighting whatsoever, no sidewalks, just a bunch of shacks. That street is still there. 
is paved now, and they've got street lighting, thank God. But immigrant families still move into that street, which is really interesting. But at that time, I mean, this was the dregs. This was the lowest of the low in San Jose. But you know what? I was on live television every Sunday. I would go from that barrio over to KNTV and, and do my five minutes, you know, on this program. Uh, first, the inaugural broadcast, and then they liked it so much that by public demand, I was brought back for 18 weeks in a row. I was paid $5 a show. That may not seem like much, but it, by, uh, farm workers were being paid 85 cents an hour when they could get it. So that was more or less like six, seven hours of labor in the fields, and I was going in there and doing five minutes and getting $5. That was fantastic. I realized the power of show business. <laughs> I said, I want to do this, you know. But what's interesting, I got an art director, and so I, I, it, that native, basic, raw experience really set me up. But what's interesting also is that, going back to six-year-old little Louis, is in addition to the paper mache, secret of paper mache, and my unrequited love of the theater, I also carried this residual anger and the, because I had been evicted from the camp and denied my audition on the world stage by injustice in farm labor. So approximately 20 years after that experience, I went to Cesar Chavez and pitched him an idea for a theater of, by, and for farm workers. To go back to the idea of the power of zero, the fullness of, the empty fullness and the full emptiness of the Mayan zero was my experience as a farm worker. Because you see, you combine farm worker with theater, and it's an oxymoron. You've got, it's a contradiction in terms. Farm workers, theater? El Teatro Campesino? That doesn't make any sense, because the theater is supposed to belong to the upper classes. Surely, the middle class, but the upper classes, the muddied people, they're the ones, you know. Shakespeare wrote for the king, he had all the king's men. He was uh, supported by the crown. No farm worker was ever supported to do theater. So I had to kind of do it on my own, the power of the emptiness. So I tapped into the movement that Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta had become in Delano, where I was born. I was born there in Chinatown, in Delano. 67 years before I was born, Delano was established because the Central Pacific Railroad was just being laid across the San Joaquin Valley back in 1873, and there was a recession and a depression in the country during the U.S. Success Grant Administration, and the train just stopped building. And they disemployed, they laid off all the Chinese workers that were building the railroad, so the Chinese workers camped out beside the railroad. And uh, cholera set in, and they began to die, and they buried them right there. Well, what happened is that Chinatown developed right there by the railroad, and then the town of Delano developed because it became the railhead, and eventually agriculture developed there. Well, 67 years after the Chinese were left stranded there, I was born in Chinatown in a labor camp in Delano. So then my heart goes out to the Chinese workers, and I'm saying, okay, I'm there. And so Filipinos became my friends, you know. And uh, there was, in 1947, a little kid moved into my town of Earlymont, which is next to Delano, and they, they were farm workers, and I thought he was a Filipino. And because uh, he was brown like me, but he looked Asian. So I said, yeah, he's a Filipino. His name was Esteban. So we played together. So one day, Esteban, I went to Esteban to his home down the street. Home is uh, probably too pretty a word. He lived in a shack. And the kitchen was a cardboard lean-to made out of cardboard boxes. And they had a wooden stove. But what really set me back and astonished me was his mother. She was Japanese. She was an elegant, beautiful Japanese woman, and she cooked Japanese food. And so my first experience with food other than the Mexican food was with my friend Esteban. You know, I'd hang around. They were poor. I'd hang around, you know, and his mother would say, do you want to eat with us? I'd say, mm, yeah, okay. And so I began to eat with them. My, the first rice ball I ever ate in my life came from her hands. And it was like discovering another universe, a rice ball with a plum inside of it. That was my friend Esteban. Her parents were biracial. His father, Esteban's father, was a Mexican-American. His name was uh, Benjamin Cornejo. And the mother was Thelma Yamada. And uh, Thelma was obviously a pseudonym. She was, uh, it was a Japanese Teruko or some, some other name. 
But in any case, uh, they were there for the summer. We played, and then they moved away. And I really missed him. I missed Esteban. But I never forgot them. Years later, like 2013, we premiered a play in San Juan Bautista in a Teatro Campesino called Valley of the Heart. And I decided to name the characters Benjamin and Thelma because he's Mexican-American and she's Japanese-American. Although I couldn't tell the story of that family because I never knew what happened to my friend, we put on this play and then premiered it in workshop in San Juan Bautista. And a couple came to see it and they asked me after the show, we love the play, she says, but why did you name them Benjamin and Thelma? And I told them the story and I said, why did you ask? And they told me, well, we had a Benjamin and Thelma were our cousins. And I said, really? <laughs> and it turns out that this was Esteban's parents. They were cousins. And they were dead by now. And it turned out my friend Esteban was also, had recently deceased because of prostate cancer. He was in his 70s, like me. So what happened then is that the family came. Esteban's wife, his kids, his grandchildren, they came to see the play. Again, another story from my, seven, my kid, my childhood. The little six-year-old had met Esteban. We were both seven by then. But here's another root, the empty fullness, the full emptiness. So Valley of the Heart became uh, my latest play, not the most recent, recent play, but Valley of the Heart is now going to premiere at the Mark Taper Forum as part of the 1819 season in Los Angeles. It's probably, it's probably a movie. You know, that's not so impossible anymore because my career began to march. And one of the things that I did 20 some years after the Little Louie incident is that I went to Cesar Chavez and formed El Teatro Campesino uh, with the permission of Cesar Chavez. He told me, you know, there's no money to do theater. Right away he said, I like your idea, but there's no money to do theater in Delano. There are no actors in Delano. There's no stage in Delano. There's even any time to rehearse. We're on the picket line night and day. Do you still want to do it? And I said, absolutely, Cesar. <laughs> What an opportunity. And it was true that we had to create whatever we were going to create on the picket line. So El Teatro Campesino became a tool, a nonviolent tool, to bring scabs out of the field by climbing up on, on panel trucks and flatbed trucks and using the bullhorn and then beginning to do stuff. We weren't there to exhibit ourselves. We weren't there to entertain. We were there to capture their hearts and to bring them into the cause. And later we began to do actos in tiny little Negrito Hall. Now you gotta understand, you know, we had all blown out as human beings. It's so easy to let the ego take over. But be careful, okay? Watch your ego, stay humble, stay humble. I mean, I, we, my wife and I, my wife Lupe and I were in the, have been in the East Room, you know, a couple of times in the White House. We were there with Obama. First time I felt the White House was my house with Obama, you know, for the, for the National Medal presentations. But if you've never been there, you should know. You should know. The East Room is the half, is about this big. Actually, it's a little smaller than the half of this banquet room. It's tiny. The White House is a house with chips, the paint chips. It looks like an old house, you know? I guess it could build a big, fancy, East Room, they would accommodate five times this many people. But they don't because of the value of it, because there's a heart connection, because it is, after all, the White House, a house. And that sense of humility is essential to our democratic process, and certainly it is essential to the creative process. Now, the Mayas believed, they believed that we were all vibrant beings and creative beings as we go. And they were able to break down the word creativity. For them, creer es crear. To believe is to create. You create out of your beliefs. And so if you believe something, then you can create something. And then they, the word for work is men ya, which means to believe, to create, to do with love and pain. They define then work as creative activity to believe, to create, to do with love and pain. If we're all workers, we're more than beasts of burden. We are creators. And so this is a respect that must be given to all human beings, not regardless of their color, but because of their color. You know, we have a lot of criticism these days about multiculturalism coming from usually the right wing. You know, they, they don't like multiculturalism. 
And the fact is that it's not about multiculturalism and it's not about diversity at all. The truth is that the process of America and the world is a question of cultural fusion. Cultural fusion. We all become one. The people are very afraid of racial fusion, some people. The misogynists are very afraid of racial fusion. They fear it. But you know what? We're all mongrels. We're all mongrels. Uh, my sister had her DNA checked. I guess it also refers to me. I haven't done it yet. But we discovered, yeah, we're mostly Native American. We're mostly Yaki or whatever it is, you know. But you know what? We're also partially French and Italian. And here's the kicker, Scandinavian. <laughs> I can look in the mirror, hey, I'm a Scandinavian, you know. I've been there. I've been to Stockholm with a teatro. I've been there alone. You know, I've been to, we've been to Denmark. You know, we've been to the Netherlands. We've been there with a the teatro. We've made connection with that part of the world. You know, it's very interesting. And I love all the world. I love it. The whole place. The Philippines. I mean, there isn't a section. Of Africa. Africa is a treasure house. There, there isn't any place on earth that is not precious. And the people that come from there are all precious. I cannot conceive of the world without African Americans. I cannot conceive of the world without Asians of all stripes. I cannot conceive of the world without Europeans, not to say white people. There's no such thing as white people. There's no such thing as black people. There's no such thing as brown people. There's only a spectrum of the human race, and it goes from one extreme to the other, but we're all the same people. We're all the same people. And dig this. The oldest civilizations, you know, were usually the colored peoples, the Egyptians, the Egyptians. And, uh, you know, I've worked through this industry. I've had the privilege, really, the grace of God to be able to have opportunities to take me into corners I never imagined that I would ever visit. Most recently, uh, I, I, I did a voiceover for a little animated film over at Pixar. Uh, it's called Coco. <laughs> I went there as, a, my wife and I went there as consultants because they were fortunately consulting people from the community for the sake of authenticity. So we were there, Lalo Alcaraz, you know, if you know these names, you know, uh, we were there uh, in order to give our uh, opinion as to the project. It wasn't even finished. It wasn't, it wasn't even started yet. It was just a couple of scenes that had been animated, mostly sketches. And so we gave our input. We gave our input. And... Uh, but the interesting thing about Dia de los Muertos, a couple of things. One, I'll, let me finish the thought. You should know that Pixar was established by Stephen uh, Jobs, right? Steve Jobs. Now, all American Steve Jobs. But you know he was adopted, right? You know? His real father, his biological father, was Abdul Fatah Jandali. Abdul Fatah Jandali from Homs, Syria. Steve Jobs was the son of a Syrian immigrant. His real mother was also a mix. She's Swedish, Scottish, Armenian. This is Steve Jobs. All-American Steve Jobs. And now we're bombing the hell out of Syria, you know, and allowing that vicious regime that exists there to poison and kill children. How many Steve Jobs are they killing? How many female Steve Jobs are they raping and destroying? And the question is, when are we going to learn? When are we going to connect with the world? That these old definitions that are racist ancestors, are not so long ago racist ancestors, divided the human race with all these stereotypes, when are we going to get past that? In America, the legacy of slavery is not behind us. We're enslaving slaves now in prisons so that we can have them work for free. We're building prisons. That labor camp where I learned about paper mache, that has a big prison now. It's called Corcoran State Prison. You know, that's where Charlie Manson lived and died the last part of his life. Robert Downey Jr. was a guest there recently, you know. Juan Corona, a murderer of farm workers, was there. But the fact is that we've made imprisoning Latinos and blacks a cottage industry in this state. All these little towns in the San Joaquin Valley are supporting themselves by oppressing people of color. Now that has to stop, but it has to stop through the 
combined efforts of all of us. But this is where the teachers come in. This is where you have the first take. This is where you get to teach the little Louis and the little Lupes. And the, it doesn't matter, the little Johnnies, you know, the little Marys, whatever it is. The, 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 the little Abduls, <laughs> you know. You get to teach them. You get to imprint their young minds with some basic thoughts. These are ancient ideas, the idea of ethics. Let's not have a liar for Christ's sake in the White House, but we do. You know, we have a lecher <laughs> in the White House. And the fact is that this is shameful because it debilitates all of us. And the power of zero continues to generate and work new generations. I started an institute in Monterey Bay called the Institute for Teledramatic Arts and Technology. And look at that. Let's break that down. Tele. It means distance, as in telegraph to begin with. Telecommunications now. But it gave us telephone, sound at a distance, television, pictures from a distance. And so I created this term teledramatics. Not because I was talking about the teledramas of the 1950s, which was theater transferred to in front of the television camera. I was talking about the world that we're now inhabiting. That television, the television that used to be such a, such a prize in our living rooms, you know, back in the 50s, you know, we carry in our pockets now. You know, in 1967, we did our first one-hour special. Actually, we just taped it. It, was, it didn't air until 1970 for PBS here in Santa Barbara. As Teatro Campesino came back from its national tour, and they've sent three trucks from KCET in Los Angeles to Santa Barbara. Sem Semi-trucks. And on the semi-trucks, they pulled out the pedestal cameras, and then they, they had the studio, the portable studio, inside the semi-truck. And then they taped us, you know, for one hour uh, on television, and they saved the two-inch tape and eventually edited it down to one-inch tape, and it became the one-hour PBS special uh, uh, in 1970, you know. Well, you know, that big semi-truck, here it is today. We're all in the movies. I used to tell my students, we have entered a new era here. We all have to learn how to act for the camera because we're on FaceTime now. You know, we're Google chatting now. And so learn the techniques of this industry. Teledramatics and deals with the fact that we are enveloped and engrossed and immersed now in a visual world brought to us by our technology. And we are getting very confused because we can't tell the difference between reality and make-believe. We're having that trouble politically. People are watching 24-hour cable news now. And uh, what is the Fox Channel? The Fox Channel is what the Russians used to call agitprop. Agitation, propaganda. They used to accuse the Teatro Campesino of being agitprop. But as a matter of fact, we have whole networks now devoted to this activity. And we have to be wary of that. And of course, we spend an awful lot of time doing this. Well, we'll get over this. We're always enthralled with the latest technology. When the phones came in, everybody was there. The radio, everybody was there. But the fact is that we'll get away from that once we lose this. This has become something that you wear on your, in your ear. And, and our television stations, you know, will be our glasses. I can see movies. I don't even have to carry anything. I got it right here. And better yet, you don't need movies. <laughs> you don't need glasses. Because reality itself, as the Mayans knew, is a vibrant adventure. They used to say, you want to send a message? You know, the Mayans had phone booths. Did you know that? They're called trees. They would say, if you want to send a long-distance message, tell a tree. Tell a tree. That's why tele is not a Greek word. It's Maya Yucateco from the Americas. It's one of the ancient cultures of the world. Te means tree. Le means leaf. So as a leaf falls from the trees, picked up by the wind and carried... That's how you communicate, tele. The Mayans knew this. They called it tele. But they also knew that the roots of a tree are the system of communications that, tree, tree, that trees use in order to survive and to communicate with each other. So it's not just the leaves. It's also the roots. It's a sphere. It's the power of the sphere, the full emptiness, the empty fullness 
of all living things. If you take a human placenta and you lay it out, and it's a tree. It's the tree of life. So we got to know that we're all vibrant beings. Telepathy, telepathy is not only possible, it's real. We use it. As any dog knows when their master is coming. They can sense it. Because animals are sentient beings. The tiniest little spider is a sentient being. A little maggot that will eat you someday, and me, knows what it's eating. <laughs> The thing is that all of the universe is interconnected. Once you begin to know that, then you can create. But stay humble. Go back to the six-year-old. El Teatro Campesino exists today in San Juan Bautista. We have a mission there. We're still trying to save one of the original communities in California, a tiny little mission town in the Central Coast, one of the 21 missions, Mission San Juan Bautista. The cornerstone of that mission was laid when George Washington was still president in the White House. But even before that, there was a Native American Ohlone village, Mitsu, Mitsuk, Mitsuan village, called Papelachum. That's why the Spanish put a mission there, because there were enough Indians there to sustain it. This is a continuum of human activity. And we tend to look down at Native Californian Indians and say, well, they didn't have any civilization, these poor bastards, you know. But as a matter of fact, they were a lot more interconnected with California than most of us. It's just that we don't see it. We don't see it. And the ancient civilizations, my wife and I have been to Cairo. We were there actually as guests of the, of the Cairo Film Festival, and we saw the ancient with the new next to each other. We went to the pyramids at Giza, and, uh, you know, not everybody has... Is not as unclaustrophobic enough to be able to climb, but I did. I climbed into the big pyramid. I went up into the middle. I wanted to experience that. So I went up the tiny little corridor that leads into the heart of the pyramid, you know, and it gets tighter and tighter and more claustrophobic. You feel like you're going to run out of air. But eventually I made it into the king's chamber, and it was empty. Nobody else was there. But there's this empty sarcophagus, a stone sarcophagus. And of course, they have portals in the in the pyramid, and the theory is that the pyramids collected cosmic energy. So I thought to myself, hmm, let me try this. So I lay down on the sarcophagus and closed my eyes. I was trying to reap in, you know, sweep in the mystery. And suddenly I had these flashes, boom, boom. And I opened my eyes, and these two Japanese tourists were taking my picture. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well. <laughs> but, you know, those were brown people. Those were black people that built those pyramids, you know? Nefertiti was a black woman. But, you know, when we cast, we cast Elizabeth Taylor as Elizabeth Taylor, you know. Jesus, Jesus is blue-eyed. Well, no. <laughs> Jesus Cristo was a brown guy. And we say he was a carpenter because we want to clean up the story. He was a manual laborer. He worked with his hands. He was a farm worker. He was a picker. That's who he was. What's the story? The humble of the humble. That God is in the lowest places. Not in the big mansions. You know, the rich man has less of a chance of getting into heaven than the poorest person. We've got to remember that because the universe is complete and always vibrant, and always chugging. The power of zero, then, is to be found way down deep where the humility lies. So El Teatro Campesino still exists to this day in a little packing shed, converted packing shed, in San Juan Bautista. San Juan has not been healthy since 1868. It had a depression at that time, and there was an earthquake and a smallpox epidemic, and it's struggling to survive. 101 kind of left it behind in the 1930s. So we felt that that's part of our mission, too. But we, we haven't built a big building because we devote the little money that comes in to our people. We try to give it to the actors so that they can live. So we've devoted a, a little bit of money to try to improve the place. But you know, out of that have come plays. Out of that little packing shed came Valley of the Heart, Zoot Suit. These are pieces that go out into the world because San Juan Bautista is our factory. San Juan Bautista is our farm. San Juan Batista is our zero, the power of zero. 
And so whenever I go there, it reminds me of the six-year-old, and that empowers me. And each of you have a six-year-old, and each of you have a power spot. Remember to stay humble. Remember to stay at, pay attention to whom you're teaching because you never know who you're teaching. You may be teaching the next president, and she will be tremendous. You may never know, you know, and don't, don't get thrown by the color. The color is beautiful. Way back when I was a hippie in San Francisco and I dropped acid, you know, I used to do LSD, I'll admit it. I ran into African Americans and I discovered, my God, they're not black at all, they're the rainbow. <laughs> black skin is full of all the colors of the universe. It's beautiful, it's incredible. But again, it takes vision to be able to do that. And it's the kind of vision that teachers can impart, the kind of vision that can only come from the arts, dance. And the power of zero, finally, is, in, is inherent in the way that we move, in the way that we stand. Zero is not a circle. It is not even a globe. Zero is a spiral. And so, all our bodies do the spiral. Now, I'm going to be 78 in about a month. The power of zero, you see? And so, or the power of farm work. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Whatever the case is, we all have this power. We're born with it. It's a given. The Creator has, in, has given us the gift of life, the gift of vibration. Let's not squander it. Let's not kill our children. Let's not get so ego-drawn and say, I'm superior to everybody. Nobody is superior to anybody. We're all equal human beings. And working together, we can make it all happen. So just remember, what is art? And for whom is art? Thou art. Thank you. What a way to close our conference. Amazing. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Senor Valdez. Okay, so now we're headed to our last sessions. And these are opportunities for you to talk to one another, to people who are doing this, teaching the same kinds of things that you're teaching. And the final breakouts are job-alike sessions, and we have separate job-alike sessions for administrators, animation and game design, dance and theater, film and video production, graphic design, multimedia production, music performance and sound production, and theatrical and live production. So enjoy these last sessions, and we will have a general session afterwards where we will have a raffle and just have an opportunity to say goodbye to one another. So thank you again for your attendance and your connection to what we're doing here. And one more time, thank you to Luis Valdez and all of our keynote speakers.